Good morning. Coming up today on Spotlight, what's the state of urban America and urban Southeast Michigan? I'll ask a Detroit leader who has been involved for a very long time. In Charles Anderson, the president and CEO of the Detroit Urban League. And later, Highland Park Mayor Hubert Yap will update us on the progress and challenges of his city. It's Sunday, March the 4th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight from the Cube. Charles, good seeing hey, you again. Thanks very much, Chuck. Good to be here. It's good having you. I uh, understand you were in Orlando where it was nice and sunny, and well, this is what you came you back know, to. Huh? What a difference a day makes <laughs> or an hour makes in Detroit weather, or Michigan weather. So uh, you well, have to be say, prepared for everything. In Michigan, stick around, it'll yeah. change. Yes. Uh, let me start you from a national perspective yes. because you've been in this job for a long time. Uh, Whitney Young, who was probably the most historic of the mm -hmm. National Urban League presidents. Mm -hmm. If he were alive today and looking at what's happening in America from an economic perspective, yeah. not a political, economic, what do you think he'd say? Well, I think he would still be concerned about the uh, condition of many African-American communities and people uh, who are lower income. He'd be concerned about DACA, those individuals who are trying to find refuge in our country and are being treated in an inhumane way, no, nowhere near what Christian values would dictate. I think you'd be concerned that uh, there's still those people in our community who have less opportunity at education and employment, the challenges like you might have here in Michigan and in Detroit with transportation and having access to public transportation or the ability to afford a car to get themselves around or get to where the jobs are. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, he would still be concerned and, and if you were looking back, you'll be wondering, you know, why are we still at this point and what is it going to take to move this country and his communities forward. So certainly uh, advancements have been made, mm -hmm. but in many respects, his speeches would probably be very similar to yeah. what he was uh, saying from the pulpit yeah. Yeah. 50 some odd years yeah, ago. Yeah, I, I think uh, some of those speeches that were made by Whitney Young or by Martin Luther King Jr., you could still pull those speeches out of the uh, library and play them again and there still be a lot of re relevancy to what they were saying then and what we see today. All right, uh, and you're right, we've made a lot of progress, but sure. uh, certainly uh, as you inch forward, you look to see other opportunities that are there. Is the job you're doing at the Urban League now, uh, is your mission harder, easier, or just different issues? Well, you know, I think in many respects, it seems to be a little more difficult when it comes to raising money. Mm -hmm. I think uh, companies have a different way of how they want to fund programs and projects. They want to dictate or, or want their names on a, on a particular project versus funding a, a whole program or activity. You know, for a nonprofit organization like the Detroit Urban League, you know, general fund money is gold money because it gives you a chance to cover your administrative overhead. It gives you an opportunity to uh, um, pay for your facilities, et cetera, and then you have a designated grant that only pays a piece of it. So uh, I think the challenges are still the same. I think we, uh, we have a lot of issues with uh, clients. You know, when the Urban League in Detroit was founded 102 years ago, we Long called time. it vocational workforce, vocational services, and that evolved into work to uh, employment services, and today it's referred to as workforce development. But you still are working to help people find a job. Uh, you know, back in the 20s, the Detroit Urban League had a baby clinic, but today we operate eight women, infant, and children clinic, WIC clinic. So the services are very similar. Uh, they are approached in a more sophisticated way or in a different way. You know, we use technology certainly differently. There are no more food stamps. Now uh, uh, people who used to come to the store with a food stamp now come with a card. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so technology has certainly changed the way you serve people. Uh, but it has not uh, eliminated the fact that you still have to serve people. The Urban League has always been about training young people for leadership and for uh, employment yeah. as well as entrepreneurship. Yes. Are we talking yeah. enough about the trades? Well, I think we talk about the trades a little more. I think uh, there's a heavy emphasis on kids going to college, but the reality is that there are some young people who will not go to college, who will be able to make as good a living or a better living if they did well as a plumber or electrician. And I think we do need to talk it about that. It might be self-employed. It might be self-employed. Yeah. But I, you know, I was at a New Detroit board meeting a few months ago and we were talking about 
the importance of getting young people more towards the trades about how the Randolph had been uh, in Detroit public schools had been renovated to make sure $10 million have been raised to make sure that we taught kids to trades. But at the same time, Dr. Uh, Roy uh, Wilson from Wayne State said that we cannot push all of the African-American kids and all children in our community to the trades when, in fact, some of them are potential doctors and lawyers and other Needs professions. Needs to be a, so a, be a, balanced, a, blend, a balanced a approach. But we need to figure out what it is that individual educational plan for young people, what person, what it is that that person wants to do and try to work with them to get that. There's no shame in a young person wanting to go into the trades versus going to college. And at one time, we were seen to want to shame a kid who wanted to take a trade or something different than, um, than uh, a professional career. And you know what I tell young people? is whatever makes you happy, that's the job you ought to pursue, not just for the money, but money is good, but you ought to pursue the job that makes you happy. Yeah, couldn't say it any better. Uh, when we come back, we'll stay with Charles Anderson, and we want to talk about a major fundraising sure. dinner that you have coming up and some very special people sure. that you're going to be Absolutely. honoring. Welcome back to Spotlight. Uh, the Detroit Urban League headquarters sits right over on Mac. You've been there for eons. Um, you're in a historic building, the yeah. Albert Kahn building. But there's development going on yes. all around you, that Brush yes. Park development. Yes. Yes. Um, your building is probably older than anything in there, almost well, older than anything yeah, in there. Yeah. How's the building doing, and how is that fitting into that overall Brush Park development? Well, you know, we're very proud of our location in the middle of Midtown, in the middle of all the activities going around us, walking distance to Ford Field or Tiger Stadium, Comerica Park, or even to the Little Caesars Arena. Mm -hmm. uh, directly across the street from us is a Whole Foods store. But our uh, structure was, was built in 1907. It is the design of Albert Kahn, but it's also the home that Albert Kahn lived in up until his death in 1942. And the Urban League has op occupied that property since uh, 1944. But our goal is to do a capital campaign over the next year to uh, raise dollars that we can do the renovations and brighten the building back up and bring it up, make it stand out within the Midtown area. Uh, we, it's a gem. It's a gem. We're, architectural we're, we're gem. We're very proud to know that uh, uh, we have a historic facility in that middle section. We're also proud to know that we're the only one of the few African-American-owned properties, important properties in that community. So we're glad to be there. And we're looking forward to finding all those people who danced at the Urban League had their wedding reception at the Urban League. That's a lot of people. Had their prom at the Urban League, <laughs> yeah. the debutante, that, uh, including Donna Ross. We were looking forward, oh, is that we're, right? we're looking for all of those people to come back and figure out how they can support us. Okay, all right. Yes. Well, hopefully they get the message <laughs> yes. here on Channel 7 and yes. they uh, can pitch in and make sure that yes. that building is there yes. for another well, 100, 100 some odd years. years. Uh, you have a major dinner coming up on the 15th mm -hmm. of March, mm -hmm. uh, Thursday night uh, at the downtown Marriott, yes. uh, your annual Urban League dinner, uh, your Distinguished Warriors, yeah. which is the showcase of yes. this dinner. And I think yes. that's what's unique about this dinner versus all the other yeah. dinners yes. out there is that you don't have a bunch of speeches. No. You honor, <laughs> five, in this case, five, five. outstanding yeah. individuals. Yeah. yeah, Chuck, this will be our 39th annual Salute to Distinguished Warriors dinner. Uh, these are individuals, in our judgment, and those who nominated them, who have contributed immeasurably in our community in the human and civil rights arena. Some, sometimes some very unsung heroes and sheroes that the general community learns a lot about uh, when they come through. You know, someone like Bob Berg. You know, a lot of people have seen Bob Berg around, know who Bob Berg is. In most respect, when they get to find out that his real name is C. Robert Berg, you know, start learning other <laughs> now, things I didn't about, know that one. Start learning things I, I knew about Robert. Bob. I didn't know about yeah. the in but there. from okay. uh, his time spent working for Governor Milligan to his time, 17 years of working for Coleman Young during his 20 year reign as mayor, and all the other things that Bob has done in his community. And that's uh, diversity, uh, that's diversity in Boston. That's very diversity <laughs> in Boston, one end of the spectrum to the other. Mm -hmm. Or a jo George Hayes Giles, a young lady born in Mississippi, but came up to Detroit 
ultimately graduated from law school, uh, ultimately became a senior vice president and assistant to the chairman at DTE Energy uh, when they brought over MishCon, or, or somebody like Ron Hall Sr., who passed away a little over a year ago, but Ron Hall was the consummate entrepreneur. He went to school with Dennis Archer and Bill Picard, uh, up at Western Michigan University, but Ron was very much dedicated and committed to uh, uh, economic development. Uh, and at some point, he builds his own company, Bridgewater Interiors, and the company is doing very well. And his children's son, Ron Hall Jr., is doing a magnificent job of managing that company. Right, and he'll um, be yeah, honored posthumously. He'll be posthumously at our dinner. Right, and we've on, got a special uh, connection. Uh, yes. Glenda Lewis, who's yes. going to be the MC at yes. the dinner that evening yes. with Channel 7, uh, that is actually her father-in-law. Yes, And yes. Uh, a lot of yeah. people out there know yeah. that, but some people yeah. don't know that. Well, so she's she's yeah. tickled peak to be yeah, well, the MC. Well, I'm very, very yeah. pleased. because uh, Let me interject this, because we're very fortunate that the television stations here in Detroit take turns supporting us at our Distinguished Warriors Dinner. And of course, this year, Channel 7 is playing a vital role in producing the videos for our honorees. Yeah, and we're, and we're honored to do it, that. and uh, it's always that. good to be able to give back to the community. And uh, when I looked at this group of yes. people, I well, said, boy, we, we, we've got a great year to be yeah, able to yeah, well, do this. We, we can't forget the other hall in our group, Elliott Hall. That's right. Elliott Hall, uh, for 15 years, was a major officer of the Ford Motor Company, but Elliott was very involved in this community. He was active with the NAACP, the Detroit branch at one, at one point. He's been an attorney. He still practices a little law at, a little bit, at 80 plus years of age. <laughs> but Elliott, uh, you know, he started learning about all the things that Elliott has done and been involved in. It's been amazing. It was amazing because Elliott brought her to the Urban League a picture that was taken in 1988 during the National Herbal League Conference. It's a magnificent picture uh -huh. that Elliot brought as part of the history. But the other person I think it's important to note that we're honoring, the fifth honoree is Walter Watkins. You know, Walter is one of those quiet warriors and individuals yeah, who had close a long-term <laughs> long career in banking. They were the first African-American president of a major bank here in, the, in Michigan and in Detroit, if not in the country. And uh, so we're very pleased of the five individuals that we're honoring this year and the work that Channel 7 is doing and having Glenda come in to MC a program that's honoring her uh, father-in-law posthumously. It's, well, it's a great time. But it's also one of those days where we are raising funds for the general fund of the Urban League. Uh, tickets are still available, still available. if somebody's out there oh, saying, yeah, hey, I want to go. We can still squeeze them in. We can still we are, squeeze them in. We, we're not sold out, but we're getting close to where we want to be, and we're very pleased to accept others who are anxious to help us honor these individuals and at the same time support the work of the Urban League. Well, it's always a packed house. Charles Anderson, yes. thanks for thanks. running over here and thanks, uh, in this uh, rather inclement <laughs> well, weather. This is nothing. Uh, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, nothing. We'll, we'll get you back in June yes. when it's really nice <laughs> yes, out there and we'll be nothing. burning from the sun. Yes. And when we return, as soon as I can get it out of my mouth, when we come back on Spotlight, I'll sit down with the mayor of Highland Park, Hubert Yap. Stay with us. Highland Park, you're this little island uh, surrounded by the city of Detroit. A little portion of it touches on Hamtramck. Uh, you probably feel like the center of a donut sometimes. Everybody's talking about Detroit's revitalization. Do you get sick and tired of that sometimes and say, you know, we're doing some things in Highland Park and maybe not getting the attention you deserve? Well, you know, I look at that as Detroit motivates us to continue to progress and rebuild our city. Our city is like in the infant stages, we're starting all over. Um, for the first time in 100 years, we don't have a high school. And of course, we're working diligently to replace our school system, build our school system. Uh, we have a number of things going in Highland Park. And one of the primary things is demolition. We wanna get rid of the blight. And finding demolition dollars is difficult, but uh, we're working and uh, we're making it. You still have state involvement in Highland Park. Um, I know from talking with Mayor Waterman in Pontiac, one of the biggest smiles I got from her was the day she could say the state's no longer involved, even though she worked very closely with the state and appreciated the help that they gave them. Um, how close are you to that happening in Highland Park? At this point, uh, we have, we're in a situation called neutral evaluation. Uh, it's a program 
implemented by the state and it's the next step from bankruptcy. We are assigned a state administrator who assists in our growth and revitalization. And at this point, we get along fine. She's very helpful, very knowledgeable. So we're moving forward. You mentioned that you don't have the high school in Highland Park right now. How close do you think you are to making that happen? Well, we have an emergency manager, Mr. Kevin Smith, in our city, and he's doing a great job working with our local school board president. And uh, I've sat in on a number of proposals, and um, we're moving. Uh, we're going to get our school system back. It's instrumental in growing a city. It's hard to grow a city without a school system. Uh, when I came to Highland Park as a, as a young fella, my mom and dad moved here because of the school system. Highland Park had one of the greatest school systems Some in the country. great attraction for families. Absolutely. Is Highland Park growing? Yes. As a matter of fact, our TIFA board has uh, developments going. The old city hall and fire station, uh, there's a new structure down at uh, Tuxedo in Woodward. It's a business office. and. Uh, we're doing a number of things. We're, uh, we're building and growing, and we put out an RFQ, uh, and we've gotten a lot of responses nationally uh, from people who want to come into Highland Park. We have land. We have a good housing stock. You need to come see Highland Park. You may have one of the best housing stocks in Southeast Michigan. I think so. Why should young people be attracted to coming to Highland Park? Well, I would first say the location. The development downtown, the arena, sports arenas, and the social life that it offers, Highland Park is just a mile or two up the road. Okay. And with the great housing stock and the development, we're going to continue to build. It's a great place to come and live and work and play. So you can be close to the hub of a revitalization Absolutely. in Detroit, but not be smack dab in it. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Highland Park's a great location. All right. I want to take a little break. When we come back, I want to talk about some of the development that you have going on in Highland Park that people may not be aware of. Very good. We'll be right back with Mayor Yob. Do you see the future of Highland Park more in terms of uh, solid neighborhoods that you're rebuilding or more in terms of attractions for major corporations that bring a lot of tax dollars but if they ever move out then you got a big hole there too what do you see or a combination there I see a combination but of course we would like to have the homeowners uh, homeowners are not apt to pull up stake mm -hmm. as businesses do uh, I think at this point, with the proposals that we've reviewed, Highland Park is going to have both an industrial, but primarily the residential area will be developed. Um, this place called Avalon Village, um, Mama Shu, they call her, uh, has gotten a lot of national attention. Talk a little bit about her, what she's trying to do, and how that goes along with other development and initiatives at works in Highland Park? Well, she took um, this block on Avalon Street and it was blightful. And she's turned it into a very good and positive project, which gives the incentive to others to follow. But it's in line with what we're doing with the city, our development of the residential districts. It's in line with that. You've been involved in Highland Park uh, politics uh, administration of various types for 40 years, maybe a little longer than 40 years. You were with the police department for many years. You were on city council. Um, which job have you enjoyed the most and why? Police department. Why? Helping people and uh, the gratitude expressed when you do something for a family or for an individual uh, is something that I just, um, if I could choose between being the mayor and being a police chief, I'd be the police chief. Uh -huh. yeah, okay. I love that work. Uh, children, working with children. I've worked with Little Leagues and uh, the PAL League many years ago. And 
I've worked just about every unit in the police department from narcotics to homicide investigation. And, you know, it's just my calling, I believe, you know. Um, a lot of talk these days about regionalism in that it's regions versus regions versus cities versus cities. If you subscribe to that theory that we need to be moving in that direction, I think the Detroit Regional Chamber would certainly say that. Um, what's the justification for keeping Highland Park the city it is? And shouldn't Highland Park and Hamtramck be maybe folded into the city of Detroit? No, I don't think so. And maybe it's because that's, I know that Highland Park can be and was one of the most beautiful places, beautiful cities, and I know it can be. And we've got the, we've got the folk in the city who want our city and want to return it to excellence. And we're working together, our neighborhoods, our council, uh, we're all working to return our city. Uh, we are an independent city and we want to remain that way. Uh, you're very close to Hamtramck there. Hamtramck has been sort of reinventing itself as well in the midst of all of this. Is that competition to Highland Park? No, I don't see it as competition. Uh, we have a good rapport with Hamtramck, uh, Detroit. Uh, we have mutual aid programs. And as far as the makeup of the city, uh, we get along fine. We work together as communities. Ten years from now, what do you see for Highland Park? I see a, a blooming, blossoming city. I see Highland Park developed with restaurants on Woodward and bowling alleys and movie theaters like it should be, like it uh, needs to be. I see Highland Park as a place that people will pay attention to, as they did many years ago. Highland Park was the model city of the continental United States. And in my mind, that's what I see. Final question, we'll take you back to politics, which you know a little something about. Uh, this is a big political year. Uh, candidates are lining up to become the next governor of this state. We know it won't be Rick Snyder. He's term limited out. You have a candidate? At this point, uh, I'm still looking at it. Uh, still, they, st they still have to win your attention <laughs> and win your vote. I've, uh, I'm taking a good look at who will do what for Highland Park. Um, the qualifications because you know I speak and I have to speak for my community I gotta make sure I make the right choices someone is going to give us that help that we need all right uh, so all you candidates out there may want to have a sit down with uh, Mary Yob if you want some of those people from Highland Park supporting you mayor thanks so much for thank coming you in. for having it's me. always a pleasure talking with you good luck with all the things that you're trying to do and thank good you. luck in your relationship with the state that's our show for this week. I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.